Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Up next on Another View, President Obama revealed the American Jobs Act to the nation last night. Is it too little, too late, or just the ticket we need to get back to work? There have been no less than three police-involved shootings in Hampton Roads this year. All the victims are African-American men. What's going on? And Aretha Franklin sang R-A-E-S-P-E-C-T. But is it happening for our current president? Roger Chesley, Carol Pretlow, Bill Thomas, and Will Leviste are here to tackle these and other issues facing the African-American community. The Another View Roundtable is next, right after the news from NPR. Discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African American community. This is Another View. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Welcome to Another View. Don't you just love the crowd that listens to us? Isn't it fabulous? <laughs> I want to say a special thank you to least co-producer Lisa Godley, who kept things in check while I took some much-needed time off. I had a chance to spend some time with my soon-to-be two-year-old granddaughter, Ms. Patience, who I am proud to say can count to 20 and is working on spelling her name. Okay, enough. I know I'm bragging. But if you're a grandparent out there, you know how I feel. So let's welcome our Another View Roundtable. Always happy to have their wit and wisdom on issues facing the African-American community. Joining us is Roger Chesley, columnist for the Virginian Pilot, and you can read his column on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And that's right? going to change shortly to Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday ah. in a couple of weeks. Oh, okay. Well, welcome in, Roger. How you doing? Uh, Carol Pretlow, political science professor at Norfolk State University. Thank you. And Norfolk State says hi. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Community activist and dedicated, hardworking man at Hampton University, Bill Thomas. Hi, Bill. Life is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and journalist, author, and talk show host, Will Leviste. And you can hear Will on 88.1 WHOV FM at noon on Wednesdays. Hi, Will. Hi, and welcome back. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Last night, about 7 o'clock, before the Saints and the Packers, Packers thank you, <laughs> President Obama <laughs> unveiled his American Jobs Act and he said over and over, as a matter of fact, in my journalism class last night, they counted 15 times. He said, you should pass this right away. Mm -hmm. Was he on his game last night, Roger? I thought he was, but obviously he's got to uh, convince House Republicans to pass a lot of legislation that he wants to uh, get through. And they don't want him to succeed. So it's really going to be a question of do they hate the American people more than they hate the president. So we'll see, uh, you know, instead of going through all this co nonsense about the debt ceiling and getting that raised, we should have been working on getting more jobs for so many people who are suffering. I had a column this week about a woman who has been out of work for a long time, has two master's degrees, one bachelor's degree, and she can't find a job. She's basically going underneath her qualifications trying to find work right now and you know sh she is uh, reminiscent of a lot of other people uh, who are looking for work can't find work begging for work and you know w hope that the unemployment benefits will be extended yet again absolutely will do you think the plan will work I mean, the things that he talked about, he talked about payroll taxes um, being reduced. He talked about incentives for companies to hire those who are unemployed. Um, he talked about building schools, putting teachers back to work, firefighters, et cetera. It all sounds great. It all sounds like it makes sense. I mean, you'd have to go and actually do the analysis and look at the numbers. And you, know, you can give tax breaks and incentives, but it doesn't necessarily mean that a job creator is going to take that money and create a job. It doesn't necessarily mean that, but mm -hmm. I agree with Roger very much. I think that he looked good. He sounded strong, presidential. He was fired up, like, you know, like the title of my book. He was fired up. But, you know, in, in actuality, again, um, having spent time 
covering politicians. I've said it before on this show. Politicians are politicians. What you saw last night is what politicians do. Mm-hmm. And the fact of the matter is, is that um, it, if you're a Republican and you're in a position that you are right now, it is not to your advantage if your goal is for him to be a one-term president, if it is to have the House turn over and, and even stronger in Republican hands and have the Senate turn over. You're not going to cooperate with anything that he does. And, and the fact of the matter is if the Democrats were in that position, they would take the same posture. Mm-hmm. So they're just going to all wait this out and you know until it just gets to a point where people are suffering so bad and that they uh, that they rise up and force change and force a difference. There's nothing. There's nothing new or groundbreaking that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. The, the, que- the question really is: I mean, is the pain from enough of the folks in Congress, their con- their constituents, have exactly. they heard enough from their constituents that say, "Hey, stop the nonsense." We need jobs. Put your differences aside with the other party, and let's figure out something mm-hmm. to to get more people back to work. And if they don't hear enough of that, then I don't, I wouldn't expect that there would be anything that would change. Carol, the president made a point last night of saying fourteen months is too long; that we cannot wait fourteen months. He was referring to the next presidential election um, in order to make these changes. That Congress has got to get up off the duff and do something. Yeah, and I think the reason he said that, again, goes back to what you said, is that um, this is looked at as a political game. He comes up with a plan, and I think he could come up with the Holy Grail, and you would still have the Republicans in the House saying, hmm, I don't know if I'm going to pass this. They will find the weaknesses of it. And it would be the same way if the the numbers shifted, if the the Democrats were in the majority in the House and um, the Republicans were in the minority. And so it becomes a political game, which means that for us who are citizens, we've got to recognize this and then put squeeze those people who are representing us in mm-hmm. Congress. Bill, now one thing that I did notice last night, that on a couple of points, you know, when they do the applause and the standing up and all that, <laughs> that he actually got Republicans to clap and stand up too. I still believe you guys are in fantasy land. Uh-oh. Oh, Go- Lord. Government cannot create jobs, number one. Government can't create jobs. Entrepreneurs create jobs. What? The public has just spoken, according to the last news announcement I just heard, mm-hmm. the stock market is what, down 250 points, mm-hmm. 2% or something like that. It's not the Republicans doesn't hate, Ob- hate uh, Barack Obama. They hate his policies. His policies are too liberal. His policies do not help the people that need the help. On the program of Face the Nation on Sunday, they put up a very stark chart on their program. It says unemployment and job attainment, excuse me, and educational attainment. Those who don't have a college education, unemployment rate in the black community is 58%. Mm-hmm. Those who have a high school degree, it's 35%. Those who have some college, it's 15%. And those with a college degree, undergraduate or graduate, is 4%. So the other part that they made that just made some significance to me, they said that 70% of the African-American graduates from college worked for the government. 70% of black folks that graduated from college worked for the government. So the government's in a, in a downfall. We, we, we don't have any more money. So mm-hmm. it's, we don't want to pay any more taxes. So th- this whole thing is well, all, well, and I agree it, with you. Doesn't that put to a lie, though, Roger? the fact that you say that the government doesn't create jobs? There's so many. Exactly. Uh, you know, it, obviously, a government, 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 is, government <laughs> is a job generator for, for those um, tasks and those duties that the federal government has to cover. Now, I, yes, it is a problem if, if so many African Americans work in the federal government and the government is going to cut some of its funding. Yeah, that's a problem. But it can create jobs. It can create public works that this country desperately needs in infrastructure and bridges and roads and things of that nature. And if you ask me, the stimulus should have done more of that, the, f- the first stimulus. Well, and passed. part of part of his his uh, announcement last night was this infrastructure bank mm-hmm. that he wants to create where private sector would, would buy into or pool their monies together, if Sounds you will, minute, in order to, to <laughs> do well, wait, this. Wait, 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 let me finish. Go, go ahead, Bill. Bill. Roger. Roger, go Roger go government create jobs by taking picking my pockets and taking my tax dollars. 
there are some essential roles it, it of government. All of our pockets well, that's there. true too, yes. but you don't care, so you can give them all your check. I mean, if you want to, you want to do that. Why don't you just stroke a check? I, okay. I've been giving <laughs> a substantial check since I started working uh, about 12, 13 years old. So, I, I mean, and there are certain things. I, I, I'm, I've always loved it when I hear this stuff about government doesn't do it and taking my money. Where, where do you think roads come from? Where do schools come from? Where do libraries police. come from? Where do police come from? Where they should come from. <laughs> oh, I said they had roles. They do have roles. And yeah, I think I, the roads... I'm so, I think si- the, okay, I'm so okay. sick of hearing this No, no, because you don't want to hear what I'm saying. Republicans minute, don't want hold Obama on, hold to hold succeed. On. And that's okay. what all this is about. We should, instead of all this nonsense about the debt ceiling being worked on, we should have been working on getting more Americans back to work. And we spent all those months with this nonsense about, you know, saving taxes for the rich, for the what? top one and two percent. You know, let's not tax them overhead, you know, too much. Warren Buffett himself said, we have not been paying our fair share while the country has been going through this crisis. This is just a bunch of nonsense. It's all that red they want. herrings. It's all distractions. <laughs> the intention, as he said, is for him not to succeed and to oh, and for them to get into power. And so it's not. If you look at it logically, they're not going to cooperate. The other thing is that you, the uh, Republican policies haven't necessarily worked either. Deregulation, let the free market system work. Well, that kind of mindset was in place for the past eight to twelve years that led us into this mess that we're in. So. These policies are not guaranteed. There is no one silver bullet, one way of doing things. So it's really just, as as we've all been saying, it's just a lot of politics and people are suffering. Hold on one second, Carol. Yeah. Um, But does the people need also hope? They need something to hold on to, especially those who are unemployed and who have been going through this. You know, and I under, I hear what everyone's saying about its politics and and so forth. But does this give people hope? Who, I think it does, and I think his demeanor and he combined um, providing essential information with a very relaxed but forceful demeanor. And some people were beginning to challenge his effectiveness because he didn't seem to be in control. So. It established control. Now, if they actually read aspects of the bill, I think then some things are going to shift and some attentions are going to be shifted. But at least he garnered a feeling that I'm in control and I have your back. Bill, despite whatever happens, there is a thought out there that this will this needs to happen right now. I mean, the president's whole demeanor last night was pass it right now. That's unrealistic, is it? Isn't it? It's foolishness. Because it's not going to happen right now. You can't build a bridge tomorrow. That's you can't design a road tomorrow with all of the government intrusion in regulations, in getting through environmental acts, the EPA. All of these things are out here, destroys jobs. So until they get rid of all of those inhibitions to job creation by getting rid of the EPA, getting rid of the, uh, all of these agencies that you have to go through all these gyrations of paperwork, that is not going to happen in 50 years. Well, the president did address that also, saying that he was going to cut things that he could to make the process go easier. Will, I see you frowning up your face there. <laughs> he, he, I mean, he's going back on his government rant. You spend time in Ohio, right? I lived in Cleveland, Ohio. You lived in Cleveland, Ohio. So you know something about the history of that river Mm -hmm. that you all have there. The Cuyahoga River. And how that river at one point caught on fire. Caught caught on on fire fire. because there was no government regulation to stop the industry from just polluting the water. So the fact of the matter is the government has a role and very much, I keep saying, we are the government. The government is not some entity that came from Mars somewhere. We are the government. We must engage our government and tell our government what we want it to do. Hold on one second. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Call us and tell us if you think that the uh, American Jobs Act will be effective or not. Give us a call, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Bill, to respond to Cuyahoga County, which is the political (laughs) government administrator (laughs) of Cleveland, Ohio, the mayor at that time was Dennis Kucinich, a very liberal congressman, liberal congressman right now. The Democrats controlled the government. They allowed the Cuyahoga River to 
catch on fire. But there's a natural recourse to that. Cleveland, which was probably had a million and a million and a half people living there, now maybe 200,000 live there. So there's consequences for that, all of that happening. But right now, the only thing that we can do as stewards of America is to put people to work. We can't put people to work, Mr. Roger, or anybody else, as an example, at ODU, which is right across the street, which is adjacent to Lambert's Point, 1% of the community population in Lambert's Point has a college degree. 50% has a high school degree. 45% don't have one. So until you fix the causes of what ails us, which is total illiteracy, among our people, not just basic skills, but skillable, workable skills, they don't possess. These people aren't but, working. They that, can't that work. That's a gross over. Go ahead, that's Roger. That's a gross exaggeration. There are people with bachelors and masters that can't get work exactly. right now. Oh, yeah. I know that. Oh, but, but, I agree. But, but okay. so it, it's not just education. It's do some of these companies that that say, hey. We're America. Are they going to start bringing jobs back here instead of offshoring it and trying to get into tax loopholes so that uh. they don't have to employ Americans and pay their fair share of taxes here? You know, you, you, some of the some of the points that the president made last night are correct. Some of the, some of these uh, organizations and some of these companies they would rather you know pay cheap wages overseas than pay fair and living wages here. And, you know, that, that is a problem, and that is part of the reason why we're in some of the straits that we are now. You know, you look at the manufacturing that has gone overseas. Do we produce enough in this country anymore that allows Americans to get decent jobs here? You know, thank goodness for you at over at Hampton that Mr. Harvey thinks so well of you, and thank goodness for me that... Uh, you know, Mr. Jones thinks so well of me <laughs> at the pilot. You know, we're in, in some situations that allow us to still be working. Uh, otherwise, we might be in trouble. Oh, no, no, yeah. no. Just one quick point. One yeah, quick that, point. Because that was yeah. a there, there, there was, there was the a pilot. There was a segment on 60 Minutes <laughs> okay, uh, last ahead, Sunday, and they said companies with people with skill sets, they would hire you today. Uh, no one is taking care of me but my mother and my father who made me go to school, who made me learn and get skill sets, and told me to be completely independent and distrustful of government. Carol, do you want to have something last to say well, before we go to a phone call? <laughs> you know, there are so many issues here. And one, I do believe it goes back to education and teachers. And all of us had strong teachers. Mm -hmm. But you can't expect teachers to suffer either. Um, they have mortgages. They have rent. They have the whole nine yards. And so I think the president was on track. I have not read track. I have not read the complete bill, so I, don't, I can't talk to it. Specifically. One of the things that he did talk about was also giving states money so that teachers could go back to my work. money. Is it our so money. you don't want teachers, huh? Uh, no, I teach my own kids. I, my kids went to oh, private school. And you can teach them through college and master's degrees and PhDs and doctorates and law and all of that. Uh, that's their responsibility. <laughs> okay, Robert joins us from Chesapeake. Hi, Robert, you're on the air. Hi. Um, there's a point I wanted to make earlier in the show. You said that the Republicans did not want to see the president succeed. I mean, I agree with that, and I also agree that the Democrats don't want to see the Republicans succeed. I think we have a fundamental breakdown of politicians doing the right thing. They're too busy pointing fingers at one another and trying to make the other party look bad. I think they need to collaborate, and I think we need to have a limit on terms, maybe maybe a limit that you can only serve one term in office. That's what the founding fathers had in mind. And then after you serve, you're not eligible to be a lobbyist. Okay. Thanks, Robert, for your call. Will, your response? I think he's very much on to something. I think it's a lot more complex than what he just said, though, too, because if you limit terms, then what happens is the, um, the lobbyists, the other people around the system that – you know, Bill is over here vilifying, and, and I agree with him on that sense, that you've got a system that is at work that people are hustling up in Washington. And if you just limit term limits to, to, to a certain extent, then you don't remove those other people <laughs> who are in the system and are really making the system move. So he's right on the sense that there needs to be more collaboration, but it's become a lot more complex 
than just that. Okay, Robert, thanks for calling. Chris joins us from Suffolk. Hi, Chris, you're on the air. Hey, how you guys doing today? Okay. Uh, I, I had a comment to make. I was watching the address last night, and I'm actually I'm a 20-year-old student. I'm studying at Old Dominion University. I'm studying to be a teacher. And uh, I heard President Obama kind of talking about, um, poss- you know, the possibility of creating some more jobs in, in way of building more schools and hiring some more teachers. And I even read an article this morning that was talking about some over uh, 200,000 teachers' jobs could possibly be made available. And, um, you know, that, that sounds like a great thing. And, and I'm, I'm happy to, to hear the proposed payroll tax cuts and incentives for businesses. And um, I guess I'm just curious because I guess my understanding was that uh, the budget, the, the newly revised budget has made a way – for us to have a little bit extra spending in order to get to a place where we can build more schools and hire more teachers. Um, but if we're offering incentives or not necessarily taxing the people who maybe could contribute a little bit more than they are, where exactly are we getting that money from in order to do those things? Okay, thanks for the call, Chris. According to the, uh, and this is put out by the AmericanJobsAct.com, um, it says that the president said last night, too, that this idea would be fully paid for as part of the long-term deficit reduction plan. I know this is about to send Roger into orbit in a minute, but I'm going to read this. <laughs> it says the president will release a detailed deficit reduction plan in the coming days that will pay for every penny of the American Jobs Act and include additional deficit reduction sufficient to stabilize our debt as a share of our economy. And he'll also call on the Joint Committee to come up with additional deficit reduction necessary to pay for the American Jobs Act and still meet their deficit target. Roger. Well, it will be interesting to see where he's going to get this $450 billion from. Uh, given all the, the, right the given all of the, uh, <laughs> we're going to ask for a lot more from you, Bill. Given just, all of the, uh, just so you know what we're laughing about, Bill just threw about six dollars on top of the desk and said, <laughs> "Here's his contribution." Since he's the richest <laughs> one around the table, Absolutely, I think we Roger. want a lot yeah, more from him. Actually, um, well, but go ahead. Given all of the infighting between Republicans and Democrats, uh, it's going to be interesting whether there's going to be any agreement on getting this uh, money together. So we'll see. But he is supposed to be coming, I think he said a week from Monday. A week from Monday. He's going to mm-hmm. release his specific proposals. So we've got to wait another week. Yeah. So do you that's, think I he should have – go ahead. Go I mean, ahead, that's, just, that's, just so, that's just so much what a politician would do. Yeah. Let's put that out. Let's put this out there. Let's see how people react. And then, and then I'll come back, back next week. I mean, come on. I mean, it, it, but, again, I like President Obama. I do, too. I, I do believe – He is very intelligent and understands what he is doing. But he's a liberal. And I'm telling you, as the listeners are listening to me, if you want your government to work for you, you've got to get engaged in it. And I'm going to tell you that the Tea Party is actually given a a very excellent model of what to do because the Tea Party is a very small, you know, percentage of the American voting population. But they are wielding a lot of power right now. Why? Because they are engaged. They are involved. They've got people in into these positions that are holding firm to what they believe in. And that's how American political system works. If a president, if the president was conservative, we would see a different plan, obviously. And, and the former president obviously had a different plan. So what do you expect when well, you keep on saying he's a liberal? Of course he's a liberal. And, but he's still, and him trying to find common ground, he's he's angered liberals for not being as far left as he could be. How can you find common grounds when your principles are so adequately or inadequately opposed to any kind? I can't give ground on my principles. I I think that we should get rid of all the unqualified teachers right now. we got to clean up the system. The system is bloated. And then you have more unemployment because those unqualified teachers. There are unqualified. Okay, let's go to Carl in Norfolk. (laughs) Hi, Carl. You're on the air. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, good program, as always. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm curious. I've listened to uh, your, you and your panel for the last half an hour. And as an African-American who has worked very hard to get where I am, I'm missing something from this, i.e., all of us grew up at some point as a, and, and benefited from the, the administration of both Eisenhower and FDR. 
And rather than talk about the nitty gritties of last night's speech, which I think was excellently done given the climate, both racial and political, um, why can't this panel talk about how to achieve those things? Okay. We're, nitpicking, we're nitpicking our opponents, and that's what they want to do to marginalize us as a people and as a race. Let's talk about how can these things be achieved. Uh, Ms. Ham, you, I think, in one, one of your earlier programs talked about a teacher who brought in her own paper so that your class could work. That's what we did as children. That's what we did as a people. That's how the WPA achieved what it did, and that's what uh, the, the general did when he walked into the White House and put in the infrastructure for the roads. Can we move in that direction? Okay, Carl, let's let's take that on. Carol? I think you're right on point, and I commend you for your insights because uh, I heard some commentators last night comparing him to Truman and the, the problems during the Truman administration. And like you, I said, okay, this was a good speech. Now we need to get to the nitty-gritty of how. How exactly? And I think that comes to play after some of us read the actual document itself and see the specifics of the plan, and then we begin to think of how to implement the plan locally. Bill? It's very simple, very simple. Cut the spending. Get rid but of entitlement programs. Uh, uh, Go ahead, Amer Carol. America but as you cut, cut, you're creating some more problems. No, and we're so not. you got to cut the spending. We can't, everybody can't be on welfare. Everybody, everybody isn't and, and on welfare. And that includes government and defense as well. Okay. We, we have to cut the spending. It's unaffordable. Our country is on the brink of dying. Okay. We have more debt. If you look at any great nation, any great civilization in the history of this world that didn't have principles, didn't have strong families, and didn't control their pocketbook, they ceased to exist. And that's where we are today. We are burdened with taxes. You, you're Come fond of with. talking about principles. There should be a right. principle to take <laughs> care of our elderly, to take care of our ill, Ill, to take care of those who need extra help or have bought into the system with a promise of getting something on the, on the other side. The, the pilot ran a poll, I guess it was last week, about, you know, where can we cut? We, we, we polled Virginians. What should we do? More than 600 people. And you know what a lot of them said? We, we think we should get spending under, under control, but, but we don't want you to cut Medicare, and we don't want you to cut Medicaid, and we don't want you to cut Social Security. And, you know, it would be kind of nice if you kept defense, you know, pretty good, too. So, yeah, in theory, we want to cut things, but when those things benefit us personally— we don't want to cut them. Well, that's you don't this, want to. No, this no, is this, this is, is six hundred people who more than six hundred people who were polled by the pilot in ODU and said we want these things because they help us, they benefit us, benefit us in our own individual lives. Hold on just one second before we continue the conversation. If you're just joining us, this is the Another View Roundtable, and we're here with Roger Chesley, columnist for the Virginian Pilot, Carol Pretlow, who is a uh, political science professor at Norfolk State University, Bill Thomas, our community activist, and Will Levise, journalist, author, and talk show host at WHOV-FM. Okay, now, Will. <laughs> <laughs> to, to Roger's point, some mm -hmm. of the same people say, oh, we don't want social medicine say but don't take it take away Medicare <laughs> right. okay exactly. what is Medicare what is Medicare I mean what is that that's exactly what it is but to the call to the caller's point mm -hmm. as I said before if you want to make a difference and get these things implemented first look at what the Tea Party has done mobilizing around what their core issues are and engaging politicians so engage your politician number two Bill's been talking about this educating yourself is key. Educate yourself. And what I've always been telling my children, educate yourself, get college educated. And guess what? Go and start a business and create Thank a you. job for, your for yourself mm -hmm. because yeah, you can't agree. depend on companies um, hiring you or keeping you. I've been through that two, three times. Absolutely. You cannot depend on a company uh, giving you a job. That that error is long gone. gone. It's over. You have to educate yourself 
and create opportunities for yourself. For yourself. Let's see. Uh, Anthony has been holding for quite a while. Let's go to him in Virginia Beach. Hi, Anthony. You're on the air. Uh, good evening to you. I appreciate you taking my call. Sure. And uh, I couldn't just but help uh, to listen in and tune into your station. Uh, first of all, I just want to comment on the um, the president's uh, uh, speech last night. I think it was a, a great thing uh, that he's trying to put out, but I was hearing something with regards to the speaker saying they don't hate Obama, but they hate his uh, policies, and I disagree with that. From day one, this man been catching it, and I never knew so much disrespect towards a president. You know, people calling him liar and uh, monkey and uh, they saying they're going to make his uh, make him a first term policy. And uh, see, I'm a 21 year old vet and um, I, I retired in 2008. So all this stuff that you're seeing, um, it wasn't exposed until uh, President Bush left office. And um, one thing that disturbed me the most is that, um, you know, I started looking for a job. I'm an educated man and it wasn't there. So. This man, he'd need our prayers and our support as much as possible because this is bigger than him. And a president can only do um, with, with the support that he's getting. Because when this war started, this planned war started, I mean, all the money that was given, you didn't hear nothing about the Tea Party. You didn't hear anything about it. But when this man took the office, um, he told us what he was going to do when he started running. And, he, and uh, I hear most Republicans saying, yeah, you know, he's been there for uh, this amount of time. It should be happening now, and I'm, I'm just appalled that uh, the patience that the American people have because it took us eight years to get in this mess and more. So uh, look at Osama bin Laden. He killed this man. Bush was in office for eight years, and even Clinton, and you don't hear nothing about it. They try to, you know, sugarcoat it and blow it over, and they're hoping that this man mess up. They can't find anything on him. So that's the problem that they have, other than the skin color. Uh, oh, color. That's okay. all I got to say. Thank you, Anthony. We appreciate that. And he allows us to segue into our next topic about respect for the president. Is he right? Is he wrong? Who? It's, 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 it's irrelevant. It's, it's, what's it's, relevant? It's not irrelevant because respect is a part of, or should be a part of the political system itself. So um, let me ask the, let me ask the question. Let me ask the question this way. I don't e let me ask the question okay. this way. There is an office in this country called the President of the United States. And there are certain uh, uh, protocol and certain things that mm -hmm. go along with that office, regardless of whomever is in that exactly. office. Do you believe, as many people believe, many African Americans in particular believe Some. that many, I said, Some. <laughs> <laughs> um, believe that President Obama being in that office has not been afforded the same type of respect that others who have held that office has have been afforded. I think Will. I think President Obama, because of the nature of race in this country, has caught some level of disrespect. I believe that. I believe that if you emphasize that, it becomes a distraction. Because guess what? Every president, if you really analyze and go back and look at it, President Bush caught a lot of disrespect. President Clinton caught a lot of disrespect. The nature of politics, yeah. that's how it operates. That's how it works. So if you overemphasize this and get caught up in it, then, as the previous call a couple of calls ago said, okay, let's move forward on how we're going to make, make a difference, you're going to miss that. You're going to miss that. President Obama, Obama, again, is smart. He understands the political game, and he's playing it. And I would also caution people to ask, you know, look at who he has around him. Mm -hmm. Meaning? <laughs> Meaning you ought to be looking at that, too. That's <laughs> true. Uh, I agree with Will partially, but I think that he is catching disrespect. It's blatantly. Now, uh, there are rules of procedure in every organization, in any situation, the president, the office of the president deserves respect. Sure, there was disagreement with Bush. There was disagreement with Clinton. But I don't recall in all the years that I've looked at them on TV, naturally, somebody saying, you lie to a president? They call, just right they in, call now, Bush an idiot. That might be well, something, we, that might be that good, something good for your students. To have your students, once you have your One students, look at that. Once you have your students, look at that, how we, Bush was treated, treated, how Clinton was treated, and, they have, and make a comparison. And they will. 
Um, but um, yes, there is a measure. The political process itself engages in disagreement. And sure, the, in, when you look at the media and columnists saying, okay, this is, he's a liar, or he does this, or he does that. But to come to the, a, a, an organized setting, to have the president of your great country being called a liar, no, I think that's blatantly I, I, disrespectful. I'll come back to you in a minute, Bill. You know, I didn't it. agree with George W. Bush on a lot of his policies. But I never thought that he was not working in what he thought was the best interest of the country. Now, I didn't, again, I didn't think we should have gone into Iraq, and I didn't always think that, you know, what he did was right. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that bothers me is that I noticed during the campaigns when Gore ran against Bush and Kerry ran against Bush, I got the sense that some Republicans question their loyalty, question their patriotism, question what they did, uh, whether what they were doing was, you know, right for America. I and, and that's the thing that bothers me a lot of time. I think we should not question the patriotism, their belief in what's doing, whether they're doing the whole what's idea right. behind whether and, or not he was a citizen and, and, and all And I that. do get a sense that when Democrats run, they have that burden. And I think it's unfair, I think it's wrong, and I think it's disrespectful to the office of the president. Well, when Democrats ran, I mean, uh, Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton played that race game during the primaries mm -hmm. with Obama. Obama. Again, mm -hmm. it's something that politicians do that's part of the political discourse. But I think it can that, be destructive. That be, that's, yeah, oh, well, very that. much so. Bill, go oh, ahead. I, I just, well, you just made my point. I mean, what Hillary Clinton did to Obama and it, it just comes up and up and up and up. But I think it's irrelevant. I think if you get caught up in that, then you're, you're not really thinking. But Bush was just called an idiot, a fool, a, a, a murderer. I mean, I mean, and, and that, that's what happened. The one thing I do believe that's happening today, the access to technology where you can get the things that are going on in Congress and the things that you didn't used to hear about, mm -hmm. it also heightens this kind of inferment against what they're talking about, Mr. Obama. But I don't see it any different. Not mm. at all. Okay. Let's move on to our, to our next topic, which is um, African-American men being shot by the police in Hampton Roads. Since January, three incidences in various cities in uh, Hampton, Virginia Beach, and Norfolk. Some people are saying all of a sudden are the police getting too trigger happy. Um, Bill, you had an interesting perspective that we talked about before the show. What do you think about that? I'm, I'm concerned about the black men killing other black people. I'm concerned about the black high school graduate mm -hmm. in Hampton who's sitting up in her house with her mother and some idiots drive up there and murder her. I'm concerned about the 15-year-old kid who was playing on the playground in Newport News. Some idiots drive by there and shoot her. There was a 17-year study by the FBI that said between that time period, 353 African Americans have died on the streets of America. That's over five to 6,000 a year. I don't know how many people died over in I Iraq and mm -hmm. Afghanistan, but it's, it's shameful. These policemen are out here doing their jobs against an unruly, ungodly, nihilistic group of young black men, unfortunately, who don't believe in God themselves or anything else, out here shooting and killing our people. Now, we're going to talk about some policemen that are protecting our very lives? I, I just don't buy into that. Yeah, and, and this latest incident in Norfolk, you know, we ran the story. Uh, the, the police were called in the first place because uh, somebody noticed a guy who looked like he was breaking into a car. Come to find out later that the car that he was driving had been reported stolen. Police respond. They try to get this individual to stop. They park behind him, and he tries to back up and run him over. Now, yeah, because I don't think there's any disagreement yeah. that all three of these people um, had something going on that was illegal uh, or yeah. against the law. And I just, it seems to me that sometimes we, we put a lot of emphasis on these particular incidents as opposed to, as Bill said, that so many times we kill each other, you know, and we usually shoot each other to death. Uh, I, I can't get too bent out of shape when the police are trying to do their job and they want to go home safe at night, they're going to protect themselves. And it, the courts and the prosecutors tend to give them the benefit of the doubt in these incidents anyway. So, you know, why didn't, why didn't the young man who was trying to break into another car, why didn't he stop when the police told him to? Well, that's another issue in terms of respect again. Go ahead. Well, 
I think um, one point is that most crimes that happen are intra-racial. Mm -hmm. So young white men are likely killing other white men, just as young black men are killing other black men to that point. So I think we, uh, uh, again, making an emphasis on some of these, the police have done this, becomes a distraction from what the real issue is, is that I've got two young sons that are younger than 30 years old. They are most likely, if they're going to get killed by someone, it's going to be by another black male at age. And that's what we ought to be focused on. Mm -hmm. And that's what we ought to be trying to make a difference at. And when the police do these things and we get excited because it's a unintended or a consequence that comes because of criminal behavior, again, we're not focusing on the real problem. We're focused on the long, long-hanging so, fruit. So why do, you, why do you think then that we get all worked up and everybody starts marching and screaming and hollering when that happens, when the police are involved or others? But there seems to be little uh, public outcry when it's African-American on African-American I'm not exactly sure. And, Will, you are right in, in saying usually it is black on black crime or mm -hmm. white on white crime or latino on latino mm -hmm. crime that's that's true but we also need to come to the gr come to grips with the fact that our violence is we're disproportionately oh, represented mm -hmm. in violent acts um we're disproportionately represented in uh incarceration in in parole and probation i mean and we That's ought to be and we ought to be addressing and focusing right. on why and having exactly. a full full court press on that as opposed to just getting excited when um you know a police officer kills a black because it reminds us of a time back in the past when mm -hmm. you know the mm -hmm. the 60s and 70s and and when all those things happen and we get reminiscent and we get riled up you know and Again, it's a distraction from what is the real issue on a daily basis of why we are disproportionately represented like Bill. this. Bill. Yes, ma'am. What's your thoughts? I, what I are just, your thoughts? Oh, it's really simple <laughs> to me. I think we have our children are unchurched. Uh, I read some statistics from the uh, Department of Juvenile Justice in Virginia that said some of our leading urban communities have 100% illegitimacy and, 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 and ladies not having uh, committed relationships and marriage when they have these children. Um, and they're having five and six different kids with five and six different males. That it's just, and they're, they're just victims. And, and, our, and our, it's our black women that really hurts me is that you have these nihilistic black men that have no values whatsoever. And then we'll, we'll put all of these kids in one of our urban schoolhouses and, and, it's, and I don't understand it. So it, what do you suggest that we do then? <laughs> I, I, su I suggest that we create a reform school and take all these kids out that don't have the kind of socialization that they need and try to get them reformed. I think the kids that are working hard, black and white, that want to study hard and do what they got to do, should be able to do that in a safe environment. And they're, they're not able to do that. I think we ought to have, you can look at, you can look at why you look at, you can look at employers. They look at zip codes. They'll see where you live and what environment you live in. You can say, oh, that doesn't happen. It does happen. Take, don't put your zip code on your resume. They'll look at it and say, no, I don't want to hire anybody who lives in that environment. And, and we turn our back to it. I don't understand it. And then everybody's going to get mad at me and write me and call me and say, I'm just being horrible. No, I'm not being horrible. The fact is 353,000 of us have died on the streets. That's more than the city of Portsmouth, Hampton, and probably Chesapeake combined. Wiped out, gone. And we say nothing, then when a policeman like Roger Sin is doing his job protecting me, I say right on. You do whatever you have to do to protect me because if we have to do that. And then we have to address the issue. Our kids aren't educated, 50 okay. or, or, less, or less percent are graduating from high school. I mean, it's, it's all evident. Carol? And I think you're right on target when you say that we need to look at our communities and begin to reform. But the problem is how and in what ways. We've had reform schools before, and all that did was create another class of criminals. And so I, I do uh, believe I that. that, well, <laughs> yeah, um, I do believe that we need to be proactive and begin to think. Maybe we need to think starting as early as kindergarten. What can we do to... Uh, to change the mindset of people. But there are groups of people out there who are doing these things. Yeah, you're who right. Who are working with kids. It's who ineffective. Are it's, it's, not, it's not creating positive results. It's ineffective. So what do we do? You give up on the ones that are probably 12 and, and older, and you try to <laughs> deal with the kids that no. are younger. Yeah. Go ahead, Will. See, I don't want to hear that. You See, get, you, you, you don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear give up. Give up. 
try to save the ones that can be saved. A kid that you raised, and Will, you will know it, your boys, if they don't have any socialization by the time they're 12 years old, and you and your wife didn't sit there and tell them what is right and wrong and did whatever you had to do to discipline them so they understood there were some kind of enforcement or consequences to their action. By the time they're 12 and 13, you can't do it. I disagree I, with I, you. Well, There are several people who come to themselves later in life. There are people who have gone to the military, for example. Can't do that And anymore. that helped and was able to enable them to, to turn their lives around. There are people who come to a realization of a religious experience, whether it be Christ or whether it be some other faith, and have turned their lives around. So I don't believe in giving up on people at all. I do Thank believe you. that there needs to be some drastic measures, a drastic uh, change in the education system. I, I do believe in, in, in part of what Bill is saying about if a kid is going to school and then coming home to a totally dysfunctional environment, then what they learned in school is not going to be reinforced. Mm -hmm. So we've got to look at some drastic measures. And there are schools and there are uh, programs that are applying those kinds of means that are working, that are showing measurable results. I, I, I disagree with you on that because if you've read the book, The Other Wes Moore, and it talks about two men by the name of Wes Moore, uh, one whose life changed drastically after he went to a military academy after his mother and his grandparents made the sacrifices to get him out of the environment that he was in and got him into a, a better situation where he could get some discipline his life changed the turn around dramatically but again it was almost like shock treatment had to be done with him and the person with the same name ended up going to prison for for being involved in killing somebody and going to spend the rest of his life so you don't always know who those people are that might be able to turn around. And so it, I give up, I, I, I'm not for giving up on people. Okay, David joins us from Chesapeake. Hi, David, you're on the air. Hello, David, are you there? Must okay, have apparently he, he must have left us. But apparently his point was, David, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Now, hi, you're on the air. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> hi. Hi. So did, so did you guys hear anything I said? No, no. Go ahead. Say it again. Uh, um, well, I, you know, I, I think that, you know, I was listening to I, Bill was always on the mark a lot of things, except for when he talks about the GOP. <laughs> but <laughs> I love him to death. He he's, he's, he's makes a lot of good points. But, you know, I think what's happened here within the black community, and, and you may disagree, but I think it's really boiling down to a methodology issue and theology issue of practice Martin Luther King versus Booker T. Washington. What I see is is that the Martin Luther King precepts that have been employed by the black community are failing. And what I see them coming to resolution with is that they need to do more things like what Booker T. Washington instilled. And and slowly they are starting to pull back, segregate, group, and, and focus more into the segregated type um, theology matters to in order to progress, but that goes totally against what Martha Luther King was was uh, was employing. Bill, you want to respond? Actually, actually, if there's going to be a comparison, I would rather look at W. B. Du Bois oh. and and Booker T. Washington. Uh, but the the Martin Luther King came to a realization at the very end of his career when he said these words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that all men endowed with certain inalienable rights among the includes life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But if he says a man doesn't have a job or income or family, mm. he merely exists in something that's an apocalypse that you cannot strive on, and you have to get economic equ uh, independence. So I, I think that is a part of the issue, but, uh, sir, I... I, I, I I, in the community, I lived in community, I'm not trying to write people off not to write them off, I'm trying to save people. And, and what I'm saying now, we have an apocalypse now right now. 353,000 of us are dying on the streets at our own hand. That is ungodly. And so I, I just think that we have to figure out what we need to do and what I would try to do. I can't help everybody. I can't solve world hunger, but I do believe that if we can get one, two, or a hundred people and start w focusing on saving them just to get them into Norfolk State or to get them into ODU or Hampton University where we don't have, we have these decreasing things that are going on. And lastly, Will, right now in the Virginia pilot about eight months ago, you guys wrote an article saying that the 
uh, to get into the Army, you have to pass certain tests now. Mm -hmm. And you, have to, you can't have drugs. You can't have any kind of deviation in your march because the competition is so high. So the military used to save us, but now we can't even get in there. So that option is gone. Well, okay, Martin we Luther lesson. King was about jobs, freedom, peace, equality. Uh, I hope the call is, 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 is not saying that those are precepts that we ought not to be uh, following. But I'm not advocating people go into the military. My point was that people have gone into the military and have had their lives turned Absolutely. around. And this is after 12 years old. If, if I, I, would, I would hope that people would have not got, uh, given up on me before I turned 20. I mean, there's a lot of things that people have that Who turned come you to, around? Huh? Who turned you around? Well, I got turned around. A lot of it was when I get, when I went to college is what I discovered what my calling was and what I was going to do. Okay. All right. Roger, you can have the last word. we got less than a minute. Well, I'm hoping that there will be some agreement when Congress goes back and tries to do something. I fear that there won't be much that actually happens and will be just the, the unemployment rates will be just as high this time next year. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you all, at, at, on that note, <laughs> and we can get into it. And I think, I think in future shows we should do more discussion about what we can actually do within exactly. our communities to, um, to make some things happen. So next second Friday. We'll see you guys next month. I appreciate it. That's Roger Chesley. He is um, the columnist um, for the Virginian Pilot, a columnist for the Virginian Pilot. Mm -hmm. You can read his columns on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays until it changes to Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Saturdays. Carol Pretlow, political science professor at Norfolk State University, community <laughs> activist Bill Thomas, and journalist, author, and talk show host Will Levis. Thank you all so much again for joining me. Thank I appreciate that. Yeah. And we'll be right back. Okay, two very exciting events that are open and free to the public at Norfolk State University this coming Monday, September the 12th. First, I hope you'll join me and Carol Pretlow along with some others for a lively debate entitled, Does Your Vote Really Count? That's sponsored by the League of Women Voters, Southampton Roads. That's at 630 at the Robinson Technology Center Lecture Room on NSU's campus. And you can call 502-4973 for more information. Or you can check out movie director and activist Spike Lee. He's giving a lecture at the Wilder Center, also on NSU's campus. That's at 7 p.m. Both events are free, so come on out and check us out. For more events, uh, visit our website, anotherviewradio.org. And while you're there, sign up for our e-newsletter and drop us a note to let us know how we're doing. And finally, I would really like to give a birthday shout out to my dad, Charles Ham. He is turning 80 years old on Monday. <laughs> so you all can all say happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday, daddy. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us this Friday. I hope you have a fabulous, safe weekend. And we'll see you next Friday at noon for another view.